subject of uh, free movement of people and labour. Uh, it's something you hear a lot in the Brexit debate in the UK that uh, uh, EFTA EEA countries are obliged to accept the European Union's principle of free movement. Do you agree with that statement, starting with Professor Yarrow? It depends what you mean by freedom of movement, is the answer I always give. Um, there is freedom of movement under the, un the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which we would all tick. Um, there's freedom of movement under the European Treaty, which many of us wouldn't tick, and there's freedom of movement under the EFTA EEA agreement. And the point is simply that what you mean by free movement uh, depends upon what you're talking about. Who is free to do, to do what? Um, uh, the, there are sort of sub-questions that have to be asked. The difference, the, there is a difference of interpretation um, in the two, um, and there has to be because the EEA uh, does not cover citizenship. Mm -hmm. And so anything which involves a free movement issue uh, where citizenship rights um, play any role, which of course the European Court of Justice does, uh, that is out of bounds for the EFTA court uh, because it is bound, the courts are, are creatures of their own treaties and the treaties are different. And I, I go back to a point earlier that, uh, that was made. It's not just that um, they, they, the EEA is a subcomponent of the uh, European treaty it also has some differences, and where the differences occur, they're profound. So there's a lot of commonality in the detail on the regulation, but the major one is they have totally different objectives. An interpretation of law has to make reference back to the objectives. If you just look at the two objectives side by side, it's a big rambling set um, in the um, in the EU treaty. It's a precise economic objective in the EEA treaty. In the EU treaty, again, at that top level of objectives, you will find freedom of movement. It doesn't appear at the top level of objectives in the EEA treaty. It's there, but it's there in order to attain the top level objective. So it's what in the trade would be called the proximate objective, or in a wider sense, you might say the freedom of movement provisions are means to achieve the primary objective. Those differences are potentially profound um, in the way these systems can develop. Um, of course, how things do develop depends on politics and all sorts of things, and we have a particular history of the EEA. Um, but if you actually look at it, um, freedom of movement means different things in the EEA. And de facto, uh, the EEA agreement gives a national government, if it wants to, much greater power and scope uh, to limit uh, free movement. Um, one of the conflations in the discussion is what people have a right to do under the EEA and what they've actually done. Um, my problem always when we, we talk about Norway is we talk about what's been done and we forget that the comparators uh, have to be adjusted for relative powers. So that if Iceland says it doesn't have much influence, the relevant comparator is Malta, an mm. economy about the same size within the European system. Mm. Malta, no doubt, doesn't think it's a very much an agenda setter either. Um, and so we have to look at these, when we're looking at freedom of movement, we have to think of freedom of movement, if looking forward, how that might look um, in relation to things the British government want to do. And I think it's absolutely clear from the text of the treaty there is much more scope uh, for limiting freedom of movement under the EEA. Thank you. Yeah, I think that uh, there might be some uh, variation, but, but the basic principle is that there is there's free movement of persons within the EEA uh, as is in the EU, not only in legal text, but also in reality. 60% of migrants coming, migrant workers from other EU countries coming into the Nordic countries have arrived to Norway, 60% of all of them. Uh, and it is, and the, I think per capita, migration in the labor market in Norway is almost as high as in the UK. And it has been very successful, very good for the Norwegian economy. It brought in talent, brought in competence uh, and capacity, particularly in period with high 
activity in the Norwegian economy. And as the Norwegian economy is slowing down, some of these migrant workers are leaving. I, I, I know it's very useful what, what you're saying there, but I, I think what I'm really trying to hone in on is, are the EEA countries legally obliged to accept free movement of people and labour as it's set out in the European Union's Treaty of Lisbon? Or does the EEA agreement give EEA countries significant uh, option, as set out in the EEA agreement, to diverge from the principle of free movement of labour and people? So I'm not really so much interested in the economic case, or the, I'm, I'm focusing specifically here on the legal basis that the EEA agreement gives in contrast to the European Union Treaty. Yes, uh, well, um, the important point here would be that, uh, indeed, EEA law does not have the same concept of EU citizenship as EU law does. Uh, and it, in, it should have uh, also implications in, in practice uh, because, well, there is no, like, a fundamental status of EU citizen. In, so certain categories of... Uh, cases where uh, should be excluded from this free movement of persons under EU law. Um, but we have seen, in particular from EFTA court, that uh, this, this gap or difference between existing between EU law and EU law uh, has somehow been uh, reduced uh, through, through the practice. So I think it's, it's, uh, the, the difference is there, uh, but it remains to be seen how, how it, which way it will develop. I guess the consensus is that the principle is there for divergence, but of course how you deliver that in practice is a matter of negotiation and of politics. Yeah, but and the also in the matter of how EFTA courts uh, applies that and how national courts uh, yes. follow what EFTA court thinks. Yeah. Yes. Um, so the, the relevant articles in the EEA agreement are 112 and 113. Uh, 112 being in the shorthand being described as the emergency break. Um, I, I know this is more in the realms of speculation, but if, if the UK were to go down the route of EFTA EEA as the basis for, for our Brexit settlement, um, how, what, what do you think would be a potential process for the UK to invoke Articles 112? process for the UK to invoke. What do you think would be the right to how you do this is that how it, which way it will develop? You. So that, I guess the consensus is that the principle is there for divergence, but of course how you deliver that in practice is a matter of negotiation and of politics. Yeah, and the, also in the matter of how EFTA courts that and how national courts uh, yes. follow what EFTA court thinks. Yeah. Yes. Um, so the, the relevant articles in the EEA agreement are 112 and 113. Uh, 112 being in the shorthand being described as the emergency break. Um, I, I know this is more in the realms of speculation, but if, if the UK were to go down the route of EFTA EEA as the basis for, for our Brexit settlement, um, how, what, what do you think would be a potential process for the UK to invoke Articles 112 and 113? Uh, and you know, what, what impacts do you think that might have uh, overall on, on the EFTA EEA uh, group of countries? I, I mean, not in terms of what would the response be if the UK were, were to. Uh, invoke Articles 112 and 113. Okay. So, uh, just to uh, first, it means that in order to get to that point, you first have to enter EFTA yes. and then enter the EEA. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And then uh, basically say that you're committed to take on the obligations of free movement of persons or as in the agreement and then trigger Article 112 as some kind of security measure. Yes, yes, uh, emergency break. Yes. And then I think that you are back to the situation that Cameron negotiated the winter to, before you had your referendum. 
right? Uh, how, what kind of special situation is it now where you can find some kind of negotiations? Or are there some special circumstances related to the UK labour market that enable some kind of legitimate claim to, to pull this security clause? So you're full <laughs> all the way back to that. That being said, we have to remember that Article 112 is a security clause for some kind of exceptional situation, and it's not supposed to last as a, some kind of permanent thing, so we have to find some kind of transition arrangement and find a solution to that problem. Yes, thank you. It would be in the breach of the spirit of the agreement. One, one, and, and so slightly off that topic now, um, Article 127 of the EEA agreement says that any country wishing to leave the EEA has to give one year's notice of its wish to depart. Um, the British government argues that we will automatically leave the EEA when we leave the European Union. Um, but others have argued that, in fact, the EEA is a standalone uh, international treaty, and therefore, in, e in order to leave it, we need to specifically trigger Article 127 with, in the same way that we triggered Article 50. Uh, I'd be interested in the panel's view on that. So if, if we were to fail to trigger Article 127 before the 29th of March of this year, would we be in breach of an international treaty? Uh, there might be some other or more experts on it, but I think that either this could happen with the UK saying that they will have an intention to leave the, the EA and then, uh, and then trigger Article 127 12 months before leaving the EU. It could also be that the EU kind of notifies the others, say one of the parties are actually going to leave the EU side and therefore they will also leave. So it might be that the, it's the Commission or the member states in the EU that notifies Norway that one of the parties is about to leave. And then there will be called for this kind of do diplomatic conference to try to find out the arrangement. But as you know, in reality, the European Union and the UK have said that the terms of leaving, the, in reality, the way of dealing with the EA will be done more or less in, in parallel with the ways of leaving the EU. Okay. All right. Thank can you. Can I, can I just now, say, because this just is quite important, Chairman. Um, in the words of Mr. Davis, that was then. Um, things, things are now. Um, the, 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 the guidelines given to the Echo 20, by the ECHO 27 um, have shifted position. Um, the, the proposal now, um, under the, the, I can use the term, the vassal state uh, proposal, is that existing um, agreements, which would include the EEA, will be, to roll, be rolled over through the transition period. And therefore, it appears that the status quo is uh, on that basis, um, which I hope will be challenged, um, on that basis, um, the UK will still be in the EEA and still operating. But what that uh, proposal says is that the UK will not be entitled to take part in any body set up by whatever the relevant free trade agreement is. That, to me, means that that says, on the EU terms, the UK cannot participate in the EFTA pillar, and all decisions for the EEA will be made by the EU authorities. So that if we go back to your freedom of movement question, the difference on Article 112, 113 between the EEA and the EU treaties is control. I keep coming back to this point about power. Um, all these things reduce to questions of power. The EEA would give, in the EFTA pillar, the UK the unilateral right to trigger the safeguard measures, and it would also give it the unilateral right to use what I think is the more important freedom of movement um, provision, which is Article 28.3, first line. Um, that's a more permanent way of um, dealing with freedom of movement issues. That's a tangent. Um, so in the EFTA pillar, the control, the sovereignty is with the UK. If, however, we're in the EEA um, post 29th of March next year, um, under the current EU proposals, we will have no power whatsoever. Okay.